Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. My name is AJ Handenberg, and I am here with two fellas. One is named Graham. Hey. And one is named Thomas. That's me. And we are all three educators at a small private school in Austin, Texas, named Veritas Academy. And we all like books and letters <laughs> and history and art and each other and rain and it's raining today. Yeah, it's still it's still raining. Man, Texas needs it. I mean, yeah. Happy birthday, Texas. <laughs> happy Happy birthday. I actually went to celebrate the 4th this weekend at a lake house and it rained for a good chunk of it. So, as a Canadian, I may have asked this a year ago on the podcast, but as a Canadian, how do you greet people on the 4th of July? Happy Independence Day? Happy 4th. But Happy 4th sounds so awkward to say. Happy 4th of July. Happy 4th. I've just never thought about it. I think Happy usually the gre- the standard Texas greeting is woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you yeehaw. shoot pistols in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Well, that explains that. And then you kick your spurs together mm. and ride off on a horse. Thank you. Mm. The thing that comes to my mind is the... <laughs> is, what, what was that show? It had the funny clips. America's Funniest Home Videos. Yeah. I can only think, America, America, this is you. Bum, like, bum, that's, bum. that's what comes into my head when I'm, when I'm around the 4th. Yep. <laughs> so that's, an, it, that's also an acceptable greeting. Bum, ba, dum, ba. Just sing the song. Yeah. How was your celebration of Dependence Day? Um, Canadian Independence Day yes. is on July 1st. That's okay. Canada Day. Okay. That's where we celebrate our dependence mm-hmm. on the British throne. And? And on our vast natural resources <laughs> that we exploit for our nation's profit. No. Um, Canada Day <laughs> wow, is on... Okay. <laughs> Canada Day is on... Um, Gotta ship uh, that snow. July 1st. And I'm not quite sure what we celebrate. <laughs> we celebrate in Canada. Oh, Canada, right? But it's not like we had... It's Canada a Day. Charter, so. I don't know. You could just like stand out in a field and be like, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. C- celebrate in Canada. Uh, and the. Uh, Thinking about hockey. The traditional <laughs> greeting is one person yells out, How's she going? <laughs> and the person replies, She's going great. <laughs> Good. <laughs> sounds, and that's, that's, sounds like you had a rip roaring yeah. uh, Canada no Day. No one celebrates Canada Day in Texas. Nope. Um, yeah. So I, I do, but. Amanda wore red and white, which was really nice of her. Yeah, I wonder why. There's no, like, Canadian bars. Like, there is one. There's, a, there's, there's a Canadian one Canadian bar? bar. It's in, like, Round Rock. It's way far north. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. But they Have watch hockey. I've not been. Um, I've not been. I feel like Canada Day would be the perfect day to oh, That's go. true. I should have done that. I got a whole year. I feel like the question. Irish have lots of options oh, man. for Irish holidays. They sure do. Like, they really, you really got a lot and of bars. options. And bars. Yeah. Yeah, and you can even, like, you know, find a restaurant that, like, Mongolia. You can go to a Mongolian restaurant and be like... <laughs> Celebrate Mongolia. But no, not Canada. Canada. Well, yeah. we don't really have our own, like, distinctive cuisine. Poutine. But that's it. That's all you need. And, who, and like, not everybody likes squeaky cheese curds on French fries and But you not. could really, like, you could you could make a theme of it. Like, you could sell maple mm-hmm. syrup and moose pancakes meat. Oh, and moose you meat. are mm. preaching to the choir, my friend. I feel like Canada can do a better job at marketing itself internationally. Mm, but yeah, anyway. for sure. We're going to start that food truck. <laughs> what would you call it? Grade A food. Grade A. <laughs> Grade A. <laughs> oh. I mean, it would work. Um, How's she going, eh? It's perfect. All right. Y'all want to dive in? Yeah, let's do this. Cool. So today we're going to be talking about a book called How to Read a Book. It's by Mortimer Adler. And Graham terrified me before this episode started by asking, hey, haven't we done that episode before? Which we have not, to the best of my knowledge. We have talked about Mortimer Adler many times. He's an important dude for bringing back um, a focus on classics. He's the guy who, working for Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, curated the great books of the Western world, which is something you can still buy. Uh, He also... I think it's a nonprofit, but there's a, um, a group that puts out a thing called the Great Conversations. He, he was also a part of that. Um, but then also he wrote this book and then um, something I read kind of recently and was interested by. He, he had this whole line of books, um, one of which is the Paideia Proposal. But he had this proposal for what um, modern education should look like. Uh, and he focused that on Paideia, which is a Greek word we've referenced a few times, but kind of the growing up of a, a child into like a fully developed adult. Did he teach somewhere? What was his like day job? Mm, He worked at, 
went to Columbia and I want to say he worked there for a while and that might have been when he was doing his research but he worked for Encyclopedia Britannica mm, okay cool um, that's where he came up with the uh, or put together the great books I feel like that's a uh, when you say that's what you work for you can push your glasses up a little on your nose <laughs> You're like yes I work for <laughs> Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica slide them up the bridge <laughs> maybe not so much anymore right uh, because, because of yeah. Wikipedia yeah probably shouldn't you know buy that stock <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think I, think it's I don't think it's head it's like because our booming business. Yeah. but at the same time, like, do we have a good replacement? Because if I said I work for Rick- Wikipedia, what's the automatic assumption? Like, I'm not reliable. That's true. <laughs> or yeah, like, I'll bring the chips. Well, I think the automatic <laughs> assumption is like you run Linux. Yes. <laughs> You're a big computer nerd. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, which is probably not far off if you work for Wikipedia. Sorry for all of our Wikipedia listeners out there. Uh, so, this book. Uh, charmingly titled How to Read a Book. Um, I hope all of you are laughing at the idea of there being a book by this title. Uh, I was hoping that one of the two of you would make some joke about the way to read a book is to open it and to read the word. Oh, this is a serious podcast, yeah. Thomas. I'm used to the lack of banter and uh, uh, severity with which we approach our topics. The solemnity, please. Yeah. It's like how to build furniture, but before you can figure that out, you have to build the chair that it's written on. Yeah, it's like, exactly. I'm sorry. Do you that, write, was the, that was the best I could come up with. Right books on a metaphor, and, <laughs> and it's it's not great. I actually, I love it. it. Like a chair with like the book written on the bottom. Is that that's what I assume? No, no, no. I, it just seems like you have to accomplish the thing before you can accomplish the thing. Word. like a book on reading books. Yeah. And, and, and that's 100 percent um, what it sounds like approaching it. But there are lots of ideas contained in this book. The most important of which is the four levels of reading, which is what we'll be going through today. Um, but. The, so the four levels of reading are first introduced in the second chapter. The first chapter, just kind of off the bat, is really open with, um, first off, this is a funny name for a book. Second off, the stuff that he talks about in this book, not everyone is going to do it for every book they read. Uh, there, we have many different reasons for approaching books. So in the loosest definition of book, we could include the... Uh, uh, the instruction manual for your DVD player. You know, there are written words on a page. What we are talking about today has nothing to do with that. You have a very uh, clear intention with approaching that instruction manual. Um, please do not. The DVD player? I don't know. It was the first thing. Blue, right? <laughs> Sorry, what? Your HD DVD player. Thomas, do you currently own a DVD player? It's like, a, can, is there one in your house? It's a Blu ray slash DVD player, mm-hmm. but yeah. It's impressive. Do you I, not have one? I do not. You don't own one? No. I think my computer has some disk drives, but. I think those are going the way of the dinosaur, too. Yeah. They're not going to stick around. That's kind of a bummer. Uh, no, yeah, we have a Blu-ray slash DVD Don't buy player. that stock. <laughs> well, I have a DVD player right here on the side of my laptop. You didn't even know? I guess you I had really need it. How often do I use it? Um, all the time to watch all those DVDs. For a long been, time, yeah. this movie Hoot was stuck in my DVD player on my school computer. And so every once in a while when I was like giving a presentation, load up. Hoot would just boot up and you'd have this menu screen with an owl. Is that really... Is it, I don't know what Hoot is. It's about owls. Okay, good. Uh, I've been recently on a kick of going through the American Film Institute Top 100 Best Movies of All Time 2007 list, in case you're curious. Mm. And uh, that's required DVD player uh, to... Gotcha. Because they're old. Anyway, um, so that's one extreme of the example is, you know, instructions. Uh, But another example is sometimes we read for entertainment, and that's fine. If your goal is entertainment... Uh, please don't go through the the um, the difficult process that Adler is going to lay out in here. It's okay to read a book and just enjoy it. Um, Adler would encourage you to not only read books for entertainment, but um, and I would probably encourage people not to just read books for enrichment too. I mean, there's you should read fun books. Yeah, just when you're chilling, just to like I don't know, it's human to enjoy stuff. So. Yeah, it's it's hard to be like all Aristotle all the time. Oh man, right? the brain needs a rest. No man, it's the life. Isle of the Blessed is what he calls it. Man, reading his stuff all the time. Oh, please That's no. the good life. Um, so that's what he, he kind of gives an intro in the first chapter and then goes into these four different levels of reading. Boys, it is quiz show. There are four oh. levels of reading. I have the names, but I've had it on a yellow pad kind of in front of you all the entire time. Oh, I'm, I, I wasn't. Uh, wasn't oh, I didn't even look. Oh, really? Okay, then yeah. we can go. Um, I think a description of the level will be more helpful. Um, if we were a more professional podcast, we would have like the quiz time music, like the the something you know from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Well, you guys know happen. I can make that happen. Yeah, you could edit it in. Well, that's a lot of work. Edgy so if concerned. you're hearing that right now, that's like maybe I a bit later. Maybe that's like a patron thing that we can like <gasps> get back in for. I like this idea a lot. <laughs> that will add sound effects. That's the <laughs> you really up in our game. Be, if you if you become a patron, we will add your sound. We will effect. add your sound effects. Oh, that'd be a fun one. I like that a lot. Uh, we'll okay. give you a custom ringtone. 
Hi, welcome to classical stuff. <laughs> Hi, welcome to classical stuff. <laughs> Sounds awful. <laughs> um, so, four. I'm just trying to. Move All right, so that's quiz show. So there are four levels of reading. So mm-hmm. again, this is about the depth of the reading you're doing with a book. Could you describe to me one of these four? Ding, 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 ding. Receptive. What? Receptive. Are you saying words? No, I was buzzing in, Bob. Yeah, I meant AJ was oh. AJ just saying words. Uh, yeah. Graham, you buzzed in, so I feel like... Uh, I, bu- I buzzed in with my word. That's not that how buzzing was the answer. Literally not a buzz. You also, never told me that I had a buzz. Also you not an answer. Yeah, Graham. Consumptive. Could you describe well, describe it? <laughs> You're not going to get the words right. Oh. Um, <laughs> That's where a disease, you Graham. are just uh, reading it for plot and blowing through it fast. I'm going to give you the point... Um, I said receptive. Can I also get the point for that? No. So what? Uh, because life it's is unfair. Justice. Um, you know the points are no. The games are made up, and the points don't matter. Um, <laughs> the points are kind of like uh, Canada Day. You guys so, know that uh, I I own the audio software, right? <laughs> you can like do I am. I You're going to cut whatever. the audio. I could easily make it so that I got the point. Listener, <laughs> listen to the sound of me getting the point. Yeah. It's going to happen right here. One, two, three. Dang. And there it was. And if that's remember, me getting points because I'm in charge. If you remember who was Julius Caesar in our last podcast. Yeah, I'm Pompey. So don't I get to take control of the city for a brief Guys, period? we no one comes out good in that story. We all die. <laughs> right. You get gold poured down your throat. Aww. You get assassinated in Egypt and I get stabbed by my friends. That's a bummer. So books. Um, so, yes, the, the first... Um, level of reading, so the I guess the shallowest level, if you want to think of it that way, with level one being the most shallow, the number four being the most deep, the deepest. Uh, so the, the first level is elementary, and we'll talk a little bit more about what it actually is, but um, Graham's description of you know, you just kind of read through it, get the plot. Um, it, it's kind of in between elementary and a level we'll talk about in a second, but it, it's pretty close to elementary. Okay, uh, three more levels to reading. Oh, jeez Louise. But just think, think for yourself. So um, I'll say responsive. So describe it. instead of just receiving the book or blowing through it, you actually have some sort of thoughtful response? Yes. So um, uh, the, the closer the deep reading is a stage that uh, Adler calls analytical, and he puts that as the third level. So it's the um, third, what's that? So level three would be um, right, I don't know how to rank these very well. Anyway, it's the third deepest is I think how that works. Anyway, so there's a second and a fourth that we're still missing. Maybe yeah. the fourth one is like, I don't know if you want to call it like the religious reading or the type of reading that changes you as the reader or has this, this profound effect or becomes like a part of your way of understanding the world. I like, I like that idea a lot. Uh, he is focused almost exclusively on the book itself and oh. not, I was, the- I was going to say focused study. And so there's be? receptive where you sort of read it and think about it, but focused study is like repeated rereadings and mm. you look at the work and then bring other works into it and like comparative analysis. Yes. So the, it, that last part is what gets into it. So he calls it syntopical, but syntopical then is reading between different books. It so sucks. <laughs> uh, you only need to get one more to then tie it. Yeah. Tying's for... Socks. So let me get, let me give this to you again. So the uh, the most sh- for socks is that what you just said for soccer? For soccer. soccer. That's <laughs> oh okay. So the shallowest level is uh, elementary. That is, I'll go into what they are in a second. But elementary is the um, shallowest. The one below that, so one deeper. Secondary is the one that you're guessing, and that's not the name for it. But again, you just need to describe it. The third level is when you get into the deep reading of the text. And the fourth is when you are comparing uh, different books, comparing mm-hmm. different texts. I don't know. What's the second one? This is, I, I, I feel like this is probably the hardest one to the. I, th- I think guess. it is. It, I think it's the weirdest of the of the four. If I'm being honest, uh, he calls it inspectional. And inspectional is when you spend as little time with the book as possible to understand the structure of the book before then going into the analysis of the book itself. Uh, Adler says that essentially everyone skips the inspectional stage, and. That's why we'll spend a little bit more time there today. But inspectional is what he calls that one. And I'm going to give myself the point. So that one was worth 10 points. So oh, I win. Woof. So, so inspectional. So is that like the word? So in lots of um, modern Bibles, study Bibles, they have the structure and the outline of the book. Is that is that the work of the inspectional? They've given you the, you know, chapters one to four is um, Jesus in the, uh, is Jesus pre-ministry. Chapters five through eight are... The only reason I think that's different 
I, th- I would consider that analytical hmm. um, because I- I'm taking this counseling class um, right now and it's a class on biblical interpretation. And so one of our assignments was to go through the book of Acts and to do our own um, kind of summary of what you were just talking about. But like if you approach the text as it is, it is, it's a block of text with no divisions. There's no chapters. There's no verses. All those things are added later. Uh, so to be able to split it up, you have to know the text first. Um, so that's why I would call it analytical. Um, but yeah, it, I'll go into ins- the inspection in a second. But anyway, the uh, elementary level is the first level. It is the shallowest level of reading. Um, but it's, I mean, it's necessary. All of these build on each other. You cannot do one without the other is the argument of Adler. You might argue you can do inspectional. Uh, you don't have to do inspectional, but it certainly helps. So what you're accomplishing with elementary reading um, is literally recognizing individual words on a page. It is the literal ability to read through a book. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at this shallow level, picking up on basic things such as plot, if it's um, a work of fiction, but um, in a work of the sciences, it is understanding what is being tested. It's understanding conclusions. Um, it's just being able to follow it, follow the text itself. Um, but I call that plot. So when you all read books, is this something that com- is this something that's important? Well, of course. You need to know what happens. Yeah. Um, and this is like the basic things that get qui- get, gets quizzed on in an English class. That's, that's also, I was thinking that. Like, I think this is the stuff that um, Sparknotes would have. I think this is the stuff that is easy to, to quiz over because it's literally just what happened in what you read. And weirdly enough, when you skip this, there are problems. Yes, and I. Well, this gets into the, sim- yeah. the symbolism stuff we were talking about. Exactly, when I you have divorced students, them. like even yeah. with poetry. Before yeah. students actually understand what every line means, they'll say, "This is about war," and I'm like, "Not at all, actually. It's there's nothing about war in here." They're like, "It says bombs." I'm like, "That's <laughs> that is uh, that's a meta. Let's start over." And so we have to read through. But when you don't actually that's know really what funny. happened, or you don't keep track of who's who and what they did and where you can make some really big mistakes yeah. about later symbolism and motif. That's also like uh, when the word missile is used in anything like before what we call missiles were invented, <laughs> like, you know, they mean arrows. And so in that same way, so or they mean like things that the church wrote. That's my favorite one. <laughs> papal good. missiles. I have students that are so confused every time we talk about papal sense, missiles, yeah. like the Pope's just like lobbing bombs <laughs> I like that. Uh, and the diet of worms. <laughs> They're not actually that sounds gross. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's like where they find all the worms. <laughs> That's my question. Why do they eat them? Why do they get enough for everybody? Um, Edler says here that people people do breeze over this, and so if it, if something is particularly complex, uh, you'll you'll miss the elementary level, and you're not even really reading the book at that point. You are turning pages. Uh, he also says if something's in a foreign language that you're not comfortable with. That would also mean you have not achieved the elementary level if you don't know what the words are saying. So it's 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 just the bare bones. Like, can you read the book? Uh, and this is work that needs to be done on something yes. like Shakespeare or yep. or Dante or Milton. You know, it's it, that. Whereas maybe sitting down and reading some you know poppy pulp fiction book of the of de jour is going to be easy and requires very little of the reader yes um this first step can it's it doesn't mean elementary doesn't mean like facile it doesn't mean simple it means you know uh, well in, in a way it's the most foundational um yeah all other all other uh, meaning from a book will come from the elementary level mm-hmm. it's like the ways of reading scripture that you need to start with the literal what is mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. verse saying in the same way with the book that's that's where AJ's point of you get weird interpretations when it's not based on what a book or a poem or whatever is actually saying. So the second level is the one that is rarer. It's called inspectional reading. Um, so I will read the overview of it and then I'll go into some of the rules of what it is. So um, when reading at this level, the student is allowed a set time to complete an assigned amount of reading. He might be allowed 15 minutes to read this book, for instance, or even a book twice as long. Uh, Still another name for this level might be skimming or pre-reading. Have you ever skimmed or pre-read a book before diving into the book? Interesting. Not before diving in. I usually do it after. I read the book, and then I need to get the lay of the land. Like, if you're thinking of it like, I don't know, boating around a lake, Mm -hmm. right? You can jump in the boat, you boat around, and then if you are going to jump straight to super analytical, you'd stop in a cove and then start looking at the, the brush and the wildlife. But... If you don't really have a good picture of the whole lake, 
then you're kind of in trouble. So yeah. I, I boat around for a while, and then I'd look at a map of the lake, and then I would dive to the yeah. important stuff. Yeah, I may do that with like a history book. So if I'm going to read um, a book on the Civil War, I may sort of flip through and see what the chapters are called and sort of see how they how they sort of sequence the events or how what they focus on. But if it's a novel, I'm not, I don't really mm. jump, I don't really jump ahead cause I don't want to like hit spoilers Ruin or it. anything. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's a good point. Again, that most reading for entertainment will just stay at the elementary level mm-hmm. that you start at the beginning and read to the end. And that's kind of the end of it. Um, yeah, there are, there are only certain books that will require or benefit from inspectional reading. Um, that's probably a good sign that they would benefit from analytical and then some topical reading. Mm. Um, so, he has a, a list of things that he recommends for this um, systematic or pre-reading. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through these. Um, some of these are things that you already do. You just don't think of them in this formal way that Adler is writing them down. Um, first one, uh, look at the title page and if the book has one at its preface uh, and then read them quickly. So uh, he has this example about, um, Graham, I think you said you wanted to read this book. Edward Gibbons, um, Decline and Fall. Is I it? do. All six volumes. You monster. Um, so a, a thing, so the title of the book, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, would you want to guess uh, what is not included in that book that relates to the Roman Empire? Probably the beginning of it. So it's not going to have the beginning. It's not going to have the rise. Uh, if, if you were to guess, I don't know this, I haven't read it. Do you think it's a happy book or a sad book? Depends how you feel about Rome, I guess. Well, sure. But I guess to the Romans who are going through it. Oh, um, that would be a sad book. Right. It's probably... If it's decline and fall, it's probably about things getting worse and worse and worse over mm-hmm. six volumes, uh, culminating with, cul- I mean, whatever the opposite of culminating is, with their destruction. So probably a bummer. Of or a the glorious rise of the Middle Ages. There it is. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. But this is interesting. <laughs> so he doesn't call it the glorious rise of the Middle Ages. Yes, And, that's and true. that tells you something mm-hmm. of how well, he feels about this. Well, I think if you called it that, you'd have to focus on something primarily else. the Middle Ages yeah, and yeah. not Rome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Um, a way to start with the book is um, what is this title and kind of what does that tell you about the book? Um, I, AJ, I'm thinking of your comment that uh, Shakespeare's play is titled Julius Caesar, but Caesar does not really play a large role as a character. And that has to be something that's interesting. Um, I guess maybe because he's so important to the plot. And it might have been, honestly, uh, sometimes I think these things have to do with selling it, right? If I'm a playwright putting up Brutus, it isn't may, may, might not draw the largest crowd, but yeah. Julius Caesar probably will. Yeah, I think that makes sense. His second level is to study the table of contents. Um, and I know this is something I skip by all the time. Um, so what is what does the table of contents tell me about how the book will be structured, what's in that book, what sections are most likely the most important, um, what, what is in this book, essentially. Uh, from looking at Shakespeare, you'd see table of contents, which will show you there are five acts. The five acts then tell you how the play is going to be structured, how the story is going to be structured, what you're looking for in each of those acts. You want to meet your characters in the first act. You want to find your inciting incident in the second act. You want to figure out what the climax is in the third, and then conclusion in the fifth. So, um, in the same way with history, Graham was just talking about. So the third... And he says that's the one that's most often skipped. He says this whole thing is skipped. I say that I skipped that. And why is... What's what import or what importance does that give to you? Or helps focus your study. Yeah, yeah. So so it helps it helps for the subsequent with the analytical reading, gotcha. which will come up next. Yeah, because even in a think about the books that you all teach, I, there are I assume particular passages that you are drawn back to over and over again, or particular ideas you're drawn back to over and over again. Sure. Oh yeah. So mm-hmm. that means that there are some things you're not focusing on, mm-hmm. uh, and that just. Maybe it's you know you haven't seen the grandeur of what's in these missing sec- in these lost section in these other sections, um, or it's these parts aren't as important. They aren't worth as much study as um, the speech uh, with the friar you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it helps focus you in your in your deeper readings. That'll come later. Uh, third is to check the index. So look at the back to see what the book talks about. Um, fourth, uh, if the book is a new one with a dust jacket, read the publisher's blurb. That'll give you some little overview of the book. Uh, number five, this is when, so following off of what I was just saying, look now at the chapters that seem to be pivotal to the argument of the book. And then finally, turn the pages, dipping in here and there, reading a paragraph or two, sometimes several pages in sequence, never more than that. So just flipping through. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Um, I used to do a thing where I would open a book and read the last sentence of that book. Um, I don't recommend that as a way to do inspectional reading, but it was always entertaining to be like, I have no idea how we're going to get to that last sentence, but there it is. 
So flip through it, see what it's about. Did yeah. you have a favorite last sentence to a book? I don't, I don't remember any of them. The only, there's no reason this should come to mind. The first musical I was ever in was Annie in sixth grade, and my, uh, I was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I had the last line of the play. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my line was, yes, Annie, for you and perhaps for all of us, this is the beginning of a new deal. I rather like that. <laughs> a new deal. That was my line. <laughs> I remember the last line of Anna Green Gables. It's, uh, God, is still, uh, God is in heaven and all is right with the world. It's good. Yeah, I remember that one. Um, I was in Anne of Avonlea. That was another one. That was mm-hmm. seventh grade. Okay, so that is essentially the summary of inspectional reading. It is going over the book and um, not spending a ton of time with it yet, but you're trying to get a feel for the structure of that book. Um, but it's the reason I differentiate it from what Graham was talking about before is that um, it is what's provided to you by the author. So um, the the summaries that are given at the beginning of different... So if you have a, a study Bible and they split out the different sections of the book, those aren't provided by uh, Luke. Those are provided by the uh, the translator and the publisher. So that's the only, yeah. re- that's the only reason gotcha. I draw a distinction there. Okay, and then analytical is when you get into uh, the actual deep reading of the book itself. Um, uh, anal- uh, so... If inspectional reading is the best and most complete reading that is possible, given a limited time, the analytical reading is the best and most complete reading that is possible given unlimited time. Um, and this is, again, not recommended for most books, but um, Francis Bacon has a quote that says, some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. Reading a book analytically is chewing and digesting it. Um, analyt- analytical reading is preeminently for the sake of understanding and in the first chapter, Adler makes this distinction between understanding and learning, that learning is essentially, um, there's a simple piece of information that you can just get from reading that book. So again, you read the instruction manual, you learn how to work the thing, that's reading for learning. But learning for understanding is broader than that. Um, You are understanding a bigger idea um, than just um, how to plug in a Blu-ray player, or a TV, y'all have TVs, right? Nope. No. Okay, how to plug in a laptop. I don't know. Okay, so um, that is analytical, and there are lots of pieces to this analytical reading. Um, I won't go into all of them, but you want to, I don't know, you want to throw a guess at what goes on in this analytical stage? Probably some analyzing. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> um, hmm. I think well, and, if, if the if the last level is comparative yep. with other books, this is so. What do you have to know about the book? focus study on the single book? Yep. So making sure. connections, identifying motifs, thinking about symbols, looking at first like logical motivations behind all the characters and what they're doing, and basically making sure you understand the material first, yep. and then looking at relationships between that material with itself. If it's a nonfiction book, um, analyzing the the strength of argument or the quality of argument. Yep. yep. Um, and, or me and. Um, so I guess the, the second step is maybe even identifying where the arguments are being made, there and then is, the third yeah. step is is identifying the, the strength of the argument, or being able to um, uh, judge the, the the quality of the um, of the evidence for the argument. So I think maybe prior to judgment, it's making sure you have a full a full understanding logically of everything that's happening in the book, yeah. and then beginning to draw those connections and maybe mm-hmm. draw judgment afterwards. Yeah, he has a. Um, he, he, Adler cares about categorizing things before jumping into it. So he talks about this difference between a theoretical and a practical book, that the goal of a practical book is to change how you live and a theoretical book is not, um, or it's, there is no clear action that you would take after reading a theoretical book. So the difference between, um, uh, how to win friends and influence people very clearly is a practical book because it tells you that in the title, but something like, um, Aristotle's ethics, um, there will be practical outflows of it if you choose to agree with it, but it's more fundamentally a theoretical book. Um, so anyway, he, uh, he would look at putting it into a category first and then um, understanding, this is what AJ was just saying, you have to understand what the author is saying in that book. So, um, and that isn't going to happen on your first reading most likely. Um, you will find, in, in that reading, you might notice things. You might notice in a reading of uh, Romeo and Juliet that there are all these references to fire, that there are all these references to the moon, that there are all these references to, um, did I say light and dark, that um, you might notice something like that, but not understand why it's there. But an important part of analysis is to notice those things, to, um, uh, he, 
Adler is a strong believer in writing these things out um, so that you can actually piece them together. Um, but yeah, reading through, noticing what's similar, and then thinking on it. What is the purpose of fire? What is the purpose of um, these Christian images in Beowulf? What is the purpose of um, um, trying to make a connection to Dante? But like, what is or what is the purpose? Why does he? Why does he structure hell this way? Why does he? Um, why? Um, what does each level look the way that it does? So um, you have to understand. So you have to ask those questions as you're reading through, and then. Um, come to a concise summary of what is the author arguing in this piece or yeah i think that's probably the best way to put it what it, what is the author i mean it's basically why did they write the book what are they trying to get across in this book in their own terms and you do all of that work before you then come to a conclusion of i agree or i disagree with that book does that sound like either how you all approach books or how your students approach books i mean that yeah, yeah that's how we would approach the book in in class. In class, if 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 we didn't do any uh, that, especially that last step, I would feel like we would just it's just exposure. I've just been like, all right, look, congratulations, you know a little bit about the story of Paradise Lost and the structure of it. Let's go on to Frankenstein, right? Um, and there would be there's no understanding, there's no there's no analysis of the book. So yes. yes, for sure, that's definitely what we do in class. But I know, I, I often have the reaction of wanting to agree or disagree with the book, like as I'm reading through it. As oh, a, I was going to say that, right. that often agreement and disagreement and judgment comes far prior to full understanding of the book. Like my students get a little bit in the Iliad and they decide that they Don't like love it, it or hate it right. before they've even hit the end. Yep. And or understood, yeah, and, and understood what Homer is mm -hmm. trying to do with the Iliad. Yeah, I guess now that I think about it, I really don't, pay much attention to whether or not the kids like it. <laughs> That's probably a good way to be, right? Like, I don't care. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, or I just have the, the fundamental belief that Can I they do, will. Yeah, that, eventually. That, that, just to nuance it, because what you're saying is these are good books and they are enjoyable and you want the kids to experience that. And so if their initial reaction is, I don't like this book, yeah. that doesn't mean a whole lot. Yeah. In the same way that when I approach a big a thick book and I don't like it at first. It doesn't mean anything. It, first, mean, it probably means I'm lazy. First time honest. I had scotch, I didn't like it. <laughs> now I do. Although there is, especially at, in the earliest stages. So one of the key parts of my class, especially because it's ninth grade and we're just diving into old books is hopefully cultivating a fondness for these. Cause sure. it's, it's yes. entirely possible that they hate the Iliad and then they, that sets them on a tone and they hate the Odyssey and then they hate every other book we've read. And yep. then, they they like a book that is easy, and we do a bad job of showing them why it's worth liking books that are hard. Mm -hmm. And you set that tone early, and it's not, probably not going to go away because they'll just say, "I hate big books," and they'll believe that without ever giving them a fair I shake. Cannot lie. <laughs> and that's oh my word. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's kind of something that Adler gets at here that when we read books that are worth going through all four levels, we are. Um, we're, we're probably challenged by the book. Like, the book is probably above our current level. If it were just cotton candy, then we would just do an elementary reading and we'd just get mm -hmm. through it and that'd be the end of it. But Yeah, there are books that you grasp entirely on the first pass. Yeah, but we don't benefit from those. We don't improve our abilities of reading by only going to books that we already can read easily. But Thomas, we are modern people with no time. We need to get the right the first time. I want you to give me, write me a summary of this book so I can understand it without even having to read it. This is... I don't, want to, I don't want to name it, but there's this website that does um, like five minute, like you can read a summary of five for uh, that, that takes five minutes to get through, and that's supposed to take the place of an entire book. Mm -hmm. And most of them are practical books where, in fact, I think a five minute reading is superior to going through the book <laughs> itself. But sometimes they'll put on their like classics, and it's like, oh, yeah, the plot of Romeo, I don't know if this is on there, but the plot of Romeo and Juliet in five minutes, that doesn't do anything for me. Like, I don't know. War and Peace. Yeah, exactly. Like there's something to the experience of reading through a book like that that changes people that you won't get. A, yeah, a good book should have a reason for existing, yep. mm -hmm. right? If if it's pointlessly big, that's a bad book. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I, I think that's a great point. Yeah, the book should be no longer than it needs to be. That's yeah. a, He talks about with inspectional reading that it should be no quicker than it needs to be and analytical should be no longer than it needs to be. Some books will tap out sooner than other books. And I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's still worth the time. Do you stop books? Do you abandon books? Yeah, so... This is not a good rule. 
in its in I think time, it's a great rule to abandon books. The rule I'm about to throw oh. out is entirely arbitrary, but um, I read a book until page 70, and that's when I make a decision. So I will, hmm. if I start a book, I will commit to the first 70, and that's when I make my decision. But if I read to 71, I'm finishing that book. Oh. It, Interesting. And that I, is arbitrary. It is entirely arbitrary. I don't know where it came from. But What about you, Hannenberg? Do you abandon books and just say, like, I'm not going to finish this book? Uh, occasionally, uh, I have... Yeah, I'd say, I mean, more often than not, it's not necessarily that I've abandoned the book, but that there are other books that seem more pertinent than, at the moment. So I, I just move on to something a little bit. It's not like I make a concerted, like, this book is trash, and I will no longer read it. Mm -hmm. There are occasions like that, and there's one specific type of book that happens a lot in the professional realm, mm -hmm. and it's it's the kind of book that can be a pamphlet, but what they do is they <laughs> oh, say, here is my principle, here is five examples of that pr yeah. principle, here is me breaking that principle into bullet points, even though the bullet points are incredibly obvious, and here are discussion questions at the end of the chapter, and I yeah. see this all the time in business books, yep, yep. in how to teach books, mm -hmm. like, it's, if, if you can say it in a pamphlet, and there's no real information that's missing, Say it in a pamphlet, please. I, I don't want to read all that extra stuff. Yeah. And there have been occasions where I'm I'm reading like a long sci-fi book, and it's just, it's just too long. Like the prose is too long. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. So I don't appreciate when there are like stories and books. Uh, in the practical books like you're talking about like I feel like they waste time and I just want like give me the one rule but Sarah feels very differently Sarah likes it when there's like an actual connection to humans who do these things like um, um, seven habits of highly effective people could literally just be seven sentences and probably would be equally as practical but I don't know you miss something for all those stories, right, AJ? No, but not if they're poorly told. A lot like, of those are the. I find that a lot of those stories are are poorly wrought. The one in Seven Habits, if I'm not mistaken, is he? Uh, he's giving. He's giving. <laughs> he sits his son down, who's having trouble at school, and he gives him these seven habits. And then his son goes off and gets an A and gets on the football team and like gets a girlfriend. And it's like, wait, what? Wait, I gotta read this book. <laughs> It's just like, okay, of course. That's what's going to happen to everyone who reads this book and does your stuff. I just think it's really funny. And if they, like, uh, it's even worse when they make up the characters and it's not an honest story that happened to people. Mm -hmm. like I, I read one recently about business communication, and it was like, consider Cassandra. And she was scared to give a presentation. A I was like, no, example. she wasn't. There's right. no Cassandra. This is not a real event that has ever happened in right. real life. And I don't need you to coddle me this way. Just well, and I worry that thing. it means that the person writing the book hasn't done it in the real world, that they have to make up examples for it. Like, you should know someone who went through this. Is there a punishment for writing bad books? Like, ultimately? You're asking, um, are you asking one of the circles <laughs> I'm just saying that, like... The, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Just, to, oh, this is harsh, <laughs> but you have to hang out with the vapid people you produce. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> that actually be the perfect punishment? If, if you, if, like, you everybody read. in your business world has read your book on mm -hmm. how to communicate business wise and it's just this really shallow you gotta sit thing. through eternal powerpoint presentations of them giving their five minute summaries of your book or but, people emulating your writing and then you have to read that that's even worse oh man alive. All right. so um, I'm convinced probably unfairly but I'm convinced that the, the best business writer is a guy named Peter Drucker and the best business book ever written is The Effective Executive and I want to say it's 100 pages and it's kind of all you ever need to read like if you're into that genre and like that's all you need. And there have been countless books that have been written that are based on it or steal from it, but they, um, you know, make it 200 pages and half as much information. Anyway, um, and he was writing, I get the dates wrong, but I think he was writing in the 50s. Um, yeah, 1966 is when this one was published. So, yeah. A lot of C.S. Lewis's books are incredibly yeah. short. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The Abolition of Man is like what, 60 pages. 60 pages? Yeah. And it's. Oh, it's so good. And the, his essays, The Weight of Glory, is yeah. still has had a profound effect on my life and is 11 12 pages. pages. Yeah, 12. Yeah. We got to do a podcast on the abolition of man. We just we still do. It's coming. Do, do you want to read something? Should we read something together like that? Should we read Abolition of Man and then talk about it? Yeah, well, it? we're doing Boethius. So preview for listeners, we're having a live recording at our Paideia conference this summer. And that happens in early August, I yep. believe, right? So early August, we're going to be doing a live podcast recording. You will not hear it live, but we will, you know, record it live and then just unedited, pop it up, pop it up on the site. And then... That was just a trailer for a future podcast. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. In a world that's <laughs> populated by podcasts. I'd be okay with that world. Three intrepid young men. Uh-huh. I guess all I got. Wait. 
That's a cliffhanger. Oh, okay. um, aren't all trailers? But yeah, yeah let's. let's I would love to do the abolition of man. There's a few other books we could cool. tackle. So just um, so again, just to summarize where we are right now. So the the fundamental can you read the words that are on the page is the elementary reading. Inspectional is trying to get you what is the structure of this book. Um, what do you think will be most important in this book? Where, where should you spend your time as you go through it? And then analytical is the uh, process of close attention to actually going through the book itself. Um, again, looking for themes, looking for... Adler is very big on the idea of great ideas. Again, the requirement to be included in his canon of great books, I think, is, I think it's 20 of the great ideas have to be represented, but I always forget the number. A certain number of them have to be in there. And this ties back to what we were talking about on a previous episode that um, just because you get one great idea from a book the first time through it doesn't mean that's the only one that's mm-hmm. in there. Um, and that, I assume, is the is the pleasure of, of you all teaching books year after year, that you get to see, you know, I saw this in the Iliad last year, but this year I really see the importance of family or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so, anyway, that's, um, so that gets you to analytical, where you are looking the importance for... importance of family or whatever, some nonsense. <laughs> some, some, some nonsense. Some trash. <laughs> Faith or whatever. That's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that your takeaway from the Odyssey is like the importance of family. Like, <laughs> well, but like in reading it in high school, I never got that from it. Again, I only read it once, but I was like, it's about a dude like killing stuff, you know? Uh, whatever. You have a deeper understanding than I do. Okay, so that gets us through um, analytical reading. Again, the kind of deep study of the text. But all of this work has been focused on one work itself. So then with the fourth level of reading moves into what he calls syntopical reading. Uh, this is where he gets the name the Syntopicon, uh, which are the first two books of great books of the Western world. We've talked about it on the What is Classical episode. Um, it's a series of essays that are um, 101 great ideas and him tracking how those ideas have developed over time. Um, and so in this, yeah. And again, we talked about this on the What is Classical episode, but often you'll find uh, this kind of gets to Graham's question from before of like, did Shakespeare intend all of these symbols in his piece? It kind of doesn't matter because he would have been reading stuff that came before him and then he's writing his work. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if he is not intentionally bringing in, AJ talked about Plutarch's lives, uh, or, yeah, um, w- whether Shakespeare was intentionally bringing in, he probably was. Oh, he was absolutely yeah, he's like quoting it. it yeah, he, like, he pretty much just lifted it. Yeah, or like, yeah, the other alternate... He had, to, he had to know about Plutarch and have read Plutarch to then incorporate it into Julius Caesar, I guess is the point I'm making here, that they, they build on each other every time. And the other thing is, like, Dante, sorry, Milton, there's a thought that maybe Milton never read Dante, hmm. um, but there, he knows it, but, the, but there's knowledge enough about Dante and the, and the heavenly spheres and the sort of medieval universe that it's still a part of Milton, Mm -hmm. right? Like you don't have to have read the thing to also know about the thing. And Dante was working from a weird, I don't think he ever read the actual Iliad because his, he puts Achilles in the circle of the lustful. That's right. Not the wrathful, Mm -hmm. right? He's just different source. Mm -hmm. Where does Caesar go? Is he in the Inferno? Isn't he in purgatory for pride or is he in? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't remember him being in the Inferno. Well, he would have, he would have had to have been faithful. Christian to make mm-hmm. it to purgatory. Mm-mm, not necessarily. Right? Mm-hmm. I thought I thought that was the requirement that they had. Well, didn't they have like Emperor Trajan? Isn't he in purgatory? One of those guys was a Christian. Yeah, but but I'm pretty think, sure there's one who's not, but they put him in purgatory because he did this like really charitable acting and didn't know that he was doing charity. And he's like, oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that worked out. I'm thinking maybe it, I would put him As in As you can limbo. tell, I haven't I read <laughs> purgatory this summer yet. I remember a lot of the guys in limbo, but there are a lot of people that he names oh, yeah. and I can't remember if Caesar's there. I know that he's not anywhere else. I, just, I think Dante's like the perfect example of... I wonder if he's in the circle of tyrants. I don't know. He's like the perfect example of syntopical reading because he is... There's so many reference... Like, I feel like the um, the trilo- Dante's trilogy is essentially like a book of references to like stuff that came before and Dante's read on those things. Um, anyway, with the syntop- with syntopical reading, you have to understand the arguments of the books that you're referencing and the authors that you're referencing. But then you're drawing connections between them. So um, the example I've referenced before that I think is really cool in AJ's class is that they'll read Julius Caesar, then they'll read the Inferno, and then I guess they, they talk about what Brutus should have done beforehand, but I'm sure it comes up in the context of the Inferno. Um, but uh, yeah, like the, um, it's 
bringing these books together to say, what do these books together say about mm-hmm. love, family, friendship, loud noises from a laptop? Um, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm trying to look up where he was. I think Julius Caesar was in limbo. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's uh, comparing the ideas from, from one book to another. Uh, and I think this is where... Like this is where classical education might be complicated because in reading any of these great books, you're not necessarily reading them to say, this is the truth on X. Correct. Um, but that's complicated because we hold these books up and say, these are great books. And a piece of that must be, there's some truth in it. There's something in it that is right. Uh, but we don't necessarily affirm everything that's in the book. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there of, I don't know if that complicates a reading of, so like, uh, uh, or even maybe you focus on your students. Like, is it, is it hard for a high schooler to read through and be like, this book says one thing, this book says another thing, but my teachers make me read both. Um, I'm, but I think it's the, like having, using the Julius Caesar example is a great example. You read Shakespeare's Julius Caesar where it's a great gray area and maybe it was pretty, probably a good thing that we got, you know, that we got this tyrant and then you read Dante and Dante's like what they did was absolutely wrong you should never kill your le- it's, it was betrayal of the highest order yeah. and to have these two points of view artfully rendered and you know and um, brought forth uh, and put in front of the students in the same year is I think a really important discussion and then they uh, for them to really sort of go back and forth between like is this a good thing or is this a bad thing um yeah, I think that's no. I, I think that's a good, um, yeah, definitely important. Yeah. Um, we do a little bit in tenth grade because we read Paradise Lost, and then afterwards we read Frankenstein. And Frankenstein does a lot of harkening back to Paradise Lost because the monster says, "Well, I'm even worse off than Adam and Eve." He, he learns English, and from, he learns English from reading Paradise Lost, right. which is I and mean, Plutarch's ooh, Lives, I believe, actually, and, and Plutarch's yeah. Lives. And so the students, you know get the taste of doing that fourth kind of reading because they are now being able to compare these two things and yeah. one's fresh in their mind because they've just done it. Um, and, um, yeah, so, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's making the, it's, they become English scholars as mm-hmm. opposed to just uh, reading, reading the book and getting my grade. But I think there's also an Ottaquashio thing to be brought pew, into pew, it, pew. right? There are, there are questions that the, that maybe certain grades aren't ready for. And sure. I don't want to say ninth graders because I feel like, you know, they're, they already get a, I'm already hard enough on them. So I, I read Great Expectations as a senior and I hated that book. And I mean, you all hate it now too, but like <laughs> love this book and then um, was forced, no, just, I read it again as a part of the, um, the book club that Veritas has for parents. And I loved the book and the book hadn't changed, but what I was going through had changed. And I related with uh, Pip much differently than I had as a senior. So, I mean, yeah, just because someone's 18 doesn't mean that they are ready to engage with all the ideas. They're probably ideas that I, as a 29-year-old, are not ready to engage with. But I think even even more so than just being ready for the book, being ready for two separate perspectives yeah. on a very formative thing, yeah. right? There, there are certain things, questions, that you just shouldn't ask a five-year-old. Mm-hmm. He is not ready to grapple with questions of ethics, probably, right? <laughs> he needs... At the very base level, he needs to know don't eat on the carpet, yes. right? Tell him what Start to do, there. and yeah. that that will come later. But giving him like this dog stole from another dog. The other dog turned out to be an evil dog. Who was right? Come up with the answer. Like you don't want to do that to a poor little kid, right? right. And I think the same sort of thing bears out as you move into higher education. Which you is, just have to give them appropriate questions. Which is hilarious because sometimes you see those news articles where it's like, we told, we asked kids what they thought right. about this high-level policy proposal in government, and they said X, which happened to be the one that I want. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that is not credit. To yeah, your, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't help you. <laughs> your position. That's that's like the worst kind of ad populum <laughs> argument. It's where like, everyone agrees with Toddlers me. Toddlers love it. By the way, <laughs> they're all children. <laughs> like... Exactly. Like that's the wrong group to like have at your backside, you know, to have at your back. But I, just, I think it's something that's complicated in reading books that, um, yeah, you might have like in reading through something, you might be subjected to an idea you disagree with. And that might in fact be wrong that the book is championing as right. Um, but that's a piece people have not, people through history have not always agreed with how we feel in 2018. So it's probably an important thing to do to understand. We don't all agree on how we feel on 2018. Wait, what? 
What do you, do you all ever think? Anyway, okay. like when we talk about how like Romans felt this way or like Roman society was like this, like that's how people are going to talk about us one day. Like about all, our, po- all about our podcast. No, well, no. yes, <laughs> our cultural defining podcast. I don't know, like um, that. We uh, generalize for history of like there was this one view. There was this oh, one that in 2018 view. they looked at you know or in in like latter or in you know the United or Western world of the millennium they probably oh well, I'm sure. Um, and I think we've talked about this in the podcast, the important part of reading yeah. history and reading old books is to look for those cultural blind spots. I mean, even the last podcast, the conversation may be between you and Hannenberg about is Plutarch doing history? Well, as far as Plutarch was concerned, he was. Yes. But as far as we, as we think history is done, he wasn't. Right. Um, that's a great, that's actually a great example. Of, so history is one of the great ideas that, um, uh, Edler goes through and I have not read the essay recently so I can't but like that the idea of history has changed over time it's a weird thing to mm-hmm. think about I'll get another example so I was just rereading this as I was putting in my commonplace book yesterday um, uh, C.S. Lewis was talking about the Middle Ages and he said if you um, if you told somebody in the Middle Ages um, uh, if you told like Chaucer if you said to him um, do, why don't you just make up a story completely out of your head Chaucer would reply, has it really come to that? Because as far as Lewis was, uh, was, uh, was describing, um, in the Middle Ages, what they wanted to do was artfully tell all of the amazing stories and things that they had experienced and that was around in their world. They didn't have to make up something from their head. They wanted to, uh, they, be- you know, they had this, this belief that the world was colorful enough and the stories that are happening in our lives right now are worth telling, yeah. like this pilgrimage to Canterbury. Whereas we as modern, Lewis was saying that we as modern people think that the great genius comes from the person who can invent something whole, wholesale or whole cloth uh, from his head. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, Star Wars is just a derivative from other stories mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. That's and, that's, not, and that's why we love it. But it's not an insult. It's exactly yeah. right. It, like it, I almost think it taps into something deeper because it's referencing old stuff mm-hmm. um, in the same way that these ideas, these um, a part of being a developed human is to um, have thoughts on these, mm-hmm. thoughts and opinions that are informed on these great ideas to be able to um, defend it, have an opinion and then defend that opinion. Um, yeah, to be able to have conversations syntopically. Um, he, and I, I haven't said this, but syntopicon, um, it, it, uh, the term means a collection of ideas. So collection of topics. And isn't that what we do? Yes. On this podcast? On this podcast, podcast sure. Like we're talking synoptically. Is yeah. that the word? Syntopically. Syntopically. Yeah. Um, I think we are. Yeah. And sometimes there'll be disagreement in terms and, uh, and even using the same word, but mm-hmm. disagreeing about terms. That's and, very common between, between authors, certainly. Um, off air fisticuffs. Yeah. 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 Should we bring those off-air fisticuffs on air? Is that the argument? We, we, I mean, we did once already. We, we talked about Twain and what's his name? Oh, I was talking uh, about our fisticuffs where we fight when the podcast is done. Oh, I mean, we, we caught a little bit of it when we talked about the, the Grand Inquisitor. It's true. Yeah. Yeah, we, we ended up ch- chatting about that for a good hour <laughs> after yeah. the podcast. We was sure over. did. Yeah. Should have recorded that. Still man. a little salty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you two will agree on everything one day. That's not true. Nah, I mean, if we did, it'd be boring. boring. I mean, it's yeah. just when AJ comes around. I guess. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> what, uh, you're salty? <laughs> yes. Uh, no, to you come around to him being right. To my point of view. Um, okay, so, yeah, again, just to say the four levels that we've gone through, elementary, reading the words on the page, and uh, uh, sometimes you won't know the words, you, you know, whatever, dictionary or translate. Um, inspectional, understanding the structure of the piece that you're reading. Analytical, going into... Um, uh, the, the themes, the ideas, the arguments that the author is making and ensuring that you understand clearly and concisely what the author is, is doing with this work and then syntopically. So take those um, arguments and then compare them between. Do all pieces. books um, deserve to be discussed syntopically? No, no, absolutely not. So, um, Or deserve to be read syntopically or whatever? No, I think the, um, the majority of books that are published um, would probably just be elementary. Yeah, didn't you didn't you say that there are a great many books that don't deserve this no, kind of attention? And, and again, like the book, the books you're reading for entertainment, um, it would be um, a bore to read through them this way. Because this has been my beef with a little bit of some of the, and this was starting to happen just a little bit when I was in university and I graduated college 20, 2006. Um, and I and I know it's happening a lot more where they have these sort of pop culture type courses wrapped into right. classic like. 
classical type courses. So it's basically like we're going to read Milton and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and compare the two. One of them is better. And, <laughs> well, I know that there are Harry Potter courses, aren't they? I know. Yes. I know Harry Just Potter about courses. Harry Potter. Or, or where they're going to be saying, like, where does, um, you know, uh, Smallville rank in the Superman lexicon? <laughs> and I, I, what they're doing is they're talking about these things syntopically, but what not there, like, this criteria where we eventually say... This is, it's a, not waste. Worth this our is time. a waste of time, or this is like um, um, just sort of foolishness. I don't know. And that's why college should be paid for on the back end, right? <laughs> yeah, I, you should give me a class, and then I should pay you what I think that you really was think worth. That? Well, I mean, think about it. The way we pay for colleges right now, the kids go in, they don't necessarily know entirely what they're buying. They mm-hmm. haven't sat in any of the professor's classes. They, I mean, they maybe have toured and they've sat in one or two, but. I get into a professor's class before I know what it's going to be like, probably, because it's required. And it might be terrible. And then by the <laughs> time I graduate, I am saddled with all of the debt for something I didn't no, really know I was buying. It should be that you have to pay a set amount every year, but you get to divvy up that set amount to the classes. So like, you have to pay $10,000 for this trimester, but you can give $10,000 to your philosophy class and zero to everything else. <sighs> that, makes me, uh, that makes me nervous. <laughs> oh. For who it would select for. <laughs> I like, guess. Ah, fair the point. The popular well yeah, yeah. teachers. I don't know. Right. Okay. But That's, This is why we're not. But my point is, like, <laughs> once, sure. once you graduate and you realize what your college education was worth, you have no more voice at that college, and yep. you are paying it off anyway. Like, yeah. you're set, you've paid for it, you're gone, and you have nothing more to say. It's like going into McDonald's, they hand you a bag of food, <laughs> that you paid for yesterday <laughs> and then no by, by the time you get sick mm-hmm. you paid for it days ago and now you're out of town like it's um you have nothing more to say to that mcdonald's it's a pretty dark view of college education i think well uh, my, i'm talking specifically about these courses oh, gotcha. right okay. oh when yeah, do we yeah, realize yeah. they're a waste of time well, well when you read the title geez <laughs> college is <laughs> sort of about harry potter yeah but things. if i'm a college kid yeah, yeah, what yeah, am i going to choose you're gonna pick yeah. them. And right? that's why i'm worried about mm. allocating the money because mm-hmm. you'd give it to the harry potter teacher yeah. right exactly okay. and so th- that's my point is that the way college is set up it's not people like you like you don't pay for yes this has been worthy and i will like allot my money according to what has served me well and you know but. so then maybe so then how do we discern what should be studied syntopically and how do as, as teachers do we just like be standard bearers we just try to keep the standard high of what is talked about syntopically i mean maybe so you're saying like i get called snobby already so and there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> uh i believe snobbery is the Price. It is. It is. Taste. It is. Yes. It is snob- of, what is, is the thing I've heard you say? Snobbery is the burden of everyone with taste. Yes. Um, <laughs> are you saying so you're in a discussion with students and you're talking? Not about necessarily. I'm just thinking like Beowulf culturally. They want to talk about oh, Skyrim. Yeah, that's exactly perfect example. Yeah. We're talking about we're we're studying Beowulf. And we're like, oh, this is just how it's like Skyrim. Let's talk about Skyrim and how Beowulf was like Skyrim. Um, and Skyrim does not, but it, deserve to be talked about syntopically. You're probably right, but like. I'm almost thinking that the comparisons will stop very soon. Like there are, because they run out of yeah, runway. there are plot concerns that there are yeah plot um, elements that you can point to. Not even plot, but like stylistic elements, I guess. Like yeah. how I t- try to talk about how Arrested Development is really Brothers Karamazov. There it is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but yeah, um, maybe. So should you shoot down someone for bringing in a book other than the classics? I'd say no, because mm-hmm. that would, um, especially with. Um, students who are being introduced to the great conversation, you don't want to shut that off. As like, if they're excited to share something and it's about Buffy, like, rock and roll. But you know, someone's thirty five and like that's how they're talking about books. Yeah, you probably would look at them kind of funny. So I think I think the way to think about it is the books that are worthy of deep study will keep on delivering. Mm-hmm. Like if I am really in depth studying like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> At a certain point, it's gonna it's gonna ring hollow, and I'll need to move on to something. Unless else. it is, in fact, unless it unless it can, in fact, sure. deliver. Mm-hmm. And then, as far as what books should we bring into a discussion about a given topic? So, say I'm we are talking syntopically about the Inferno. I think that once you are leaving the book that is considered great, it, its tendrils will hope ideally reach everything. So, Good bringing point. bringing in Buffy to a discussion about the Inferno that is being discussed syntopically does not necessarily mean I'm spending. X amount of hours with Buffy. It just means that maybe it has a little something to contribute to a greater conversation. And so I think that great study will happen with works that are worthy of that great study. And then once you sort of 
like their tendrils will reach everything. And so bringing like bringing Skyrim into a discussion about Beowulf is fine. I can say yes, it's influenced the way that video games are made. It's influenced storytelling. They still bring dragons up because dragons still are cool. Are cool, yeah. right? And so it it has something to do with it. But I don't think studying Skyrim is going to deliver for right. you. Mm. And a lot of the side quests are all the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> know what I mean? So, so a video game being brought up, once, Skyrim is a video game for anyway. So um, bring up the video game, you know, a couple times in class to make the comparison is fine, but you shouldn't do an entire class on Skyrim and Beowulf. Is that kind of... Yeah, yeah. And maybe there's some in between, but I, I just think the love of learning is so important that you want to foster that, even if, like, if I... In a conversation with you all, I would make fun of you if the only thing you could compare Beowulf to is a video game. You know what and I mean? I guess like things like different things will get you in the door. Like what got me into what got me into into reading book like I read really bad Star Wars uh, novels, mm-hmm. like the X Wing series, which got me reading and I enjoyed it and then I was like, Oh, maybe I like war books and I read Red Badges of Courage. And I kind of liked that one. And then sort of that was the book that kind of got me into older books and classical books. So I guess it's like, but I'm never going to go back and reread bad X-Wing books. Right. Um, anyway, it's but just, so I guess maybe we shouldn't completely even, disparage the the, uh, the gates or the, yeah. the, whatever got you inside. Yep. Um, but once you're inside, there are greater feasts to be had. That's a great way um, to put it. I think that's it. So this has been the classical stuff you should know. You can tweet at us at C L S S C A L stuff at Twitter. So dot I just twit. The, the at comes before. The handle is at classical stuff. At twitter.com slash I think if you added more ats, it would still work. So just you can tweet at us, you can check it our check out our website at classicalstuff.net. You can email us at classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. We appreciate hearing from you. We like hearing your perspective, even if it's just some thoughts you had. And if we got some stuff wrong, you can correct us. Remember, as, as generalists, we're not necessarily experts on everything that we bring up. That's right. And that's part of the price of trying to be a generalist, right? Mm-hmm. It it adds a value to everything you study, but it, it means that you're not necessarily an expert in everything you, you study. And if you've emailed us and haven't heard anything back, just hang tight. Emails are, we try to get back to everybody. And and, I, it's, and it's weird because we all three check the email, so no one's really sure no one, who's responsible exactly. yeah, yeah, for exactly the reply. Right. Like, so, that's the uh, issue. Emails are coming. Don't worry. Yep, emails we are coming. We appreciate all your feedback. And uh, thanks for listening. If you want to hear certain episodes, let us know. Ideas are always good. I'm trying to branch out into art, so look forward to you know a podcast on Michelangelo coming soon. And uh, we'll, you know, keep keep on keeping on. Still going. And then it ends. <laughs>